Acts chapter 10, New King James Version. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian Regiment, a devout man and one who feared God with all his household, who gave alms generously to the people and prayed to God always. Now, I don't know if this means that this Cornelius was a devout Jew or if he was just a godly man or if he respected the God of the Jews, but it says later in this chapter that he was held in high regard or something or respected by the Jews. So I don't know what his religion was. Uh, <clears throat> I think a, a natural assumption would be Jewish, that he had a Jewish religion. He was a Roman military leader, leader, a centurion of the Roman army, but the Jews respected him, and he was a godly man. About the ninth hour of the day, that doesn't necessarily mean 3 p.m., but it means when the sun is about three quarters across the sky. Uh, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius. And when he observed him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? So he said to him, Your prayers and your alms have come up for a memorial before God. Now send men to Joppa. So from Caesarea to Joppa, I had to look on the map, but they're both coastal cities in Israel. Caesarea is about 33 miles north of Joppa. And in Acts chapter 9, Peter had just raised a woman from the dead, uh, Tabitha, who was called Dorcas, was dead, and Peter uh, brought her back to life in Joppa. So this is immediately after that occasion, uh, that the centurion from Caesarea contacts Peter in Joppa. So he sent him into Joppa uh, and send for si Simon, whose surname is Peter. He is lodging with Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the sea. He will tell you what you must do. And when the angel who spoke to him had departed, Cornelius called two of his household servants and a devout soldier from among those who waited on him continually. So when he had explained all these things to them, he sent them to Joppa. The next day, so uh, it takes about a full day to travel from Caesarea, if, if you're walking especially, uh, from Caesarea to Joppa. So the next day, as they went on their journey and drew near the city, Peter went up on the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. So that's about noon or when the sun is uh, directly overhead. Then he became very hungry and wanted to eat. So this sudden hunger that comes on Peter well, seems to be abnormal, not just a regular, well, it's lunchtime, time for me to eat. I think it was a uh, striking hunger, something abnormal, something that God uh, put on to Peter, not just a natural physical occurrence, but something that God did to him to make him really hungry. <laughs> It says he became very hungry and wanted to eat. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance and saw heaven opened and an object like a great sheet bound at the four corners, descending to him and let down to the earth. In it were all kinds of four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and birds of the air. And a voice came to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything common or unclean. And a voice spoke to him again a second time. What God has cleansed, you must not call common. This was done three times, and the object was taken up into heaven again. So the Jews obviously had some uh, you know, dietary restrictions. Uh, they had a lot of specific rules on what was clean and what was unclean and how they had to prepare it. Uh, and Peter was strict about following those dietary Jewish rules. But now things have changed. Uh, they're no longer. Now this is before 70 AD, before the destruction of Jerusalem, before the destruction of the Jews in the temple. Uh, so we see evidence that the Jewish system had already uh, lost its effect. Uh, I believe Jesus nailed the old covenant to the cross. The cross was, or the... Uh, Jewish rules and regulations were no longer obligatory uh, after Jesus was nailed to the cross. 
uh, and when Jesus was resurrected, he was crowned king. So the new kingdom uh, was established at the resurrection of Jesus. And the old covenant was nailed to the cross at you know three days earlier. Uh, but the purpose, or at least some of the purpose that the destruction of Jerusalem served in 70 AD was to fully confirm uh, which system was effective uh, in God's eyes, which one we should follow, uh, and even made it physically impossible to follow, follow the Jewish way of life anymore. So he said, I'm going to remove this stumbling block. Even though it's been nailed to the cross, you still stumble on it. You, you're still confused by it. So I'm going to make sure that you understand that it's no longer applicable. And that's what happened when he destroyed the Jewish system and the temple and all that in 70 AD. Um, and a voice. Oh, wait. Okay, we already read that. Verse 17. Now, while Peter wondered within himself what this vision which he had seen meant, behold, the men who had been sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon's house. That's Simon the Tanner's house, where Simon Peter was staying, and stood before the gate. So, uh, while Peter was thinking about the vision, these guys were standing at the gate of the house. And they called and asked whether Simon, whose surname was Peter, was lodging there. So they said, Simon the Tanner is Simon Peter staying here while peter thought about the vision the spirit said to him behold three men are seeking you arise therefore go down and go with them doubting nothing for i have sent them so i find this interesting that the spirit tells peter that i have sent them um now it's i guess in a way it's obvious when an angel or a vision appears to both uh, cornelius and peter but from the human perspective, from the people that were even involved in it, uh, maybe not the ones who saw the vision, but uh, I, maybe even the ones who saw the vision, they might be inclined to think that these three men that were traveling from Caesarea to Joppa were simply following uh, earthly instructions and, you know, asking for directions to Simon the Tanner's house, uh, and they they happened to be at Simon the Tanner's house at the precise moment that Peter was uh, thinking about the vision that he had just had. But I believe it's uh, orchestrated and uh, deliberately carried out according to God's will, that God was influencing everybody involved, uh, the timing and the positioning. Even when the three guys asked for directions how to get to Simon the Tanner's house, whoever gave the directions was being influenced by God uh, to give the proper directions. I believe God is that involved in every detail of everybody's life all the time. And I feel like a lot of people think that's offensive. They think, I mean, I've had some people very close to me uh, kind of laugh at me and say, oh, if God was that involved in everybody's life all the time, then he wouldn't have time to think of uh, about anything as if God is limited by anything <clears throat> then Peter went down to the man to the men who had been sent to him from Cornelius and said yes I am he whom you seek for what reason have you come and they said Cornelius the centurion a just man who fears God and has a good reputation among all the nation of the Jews was divinely instructed by a holy angel to summon you to his house and to hear words from you. Then he, then he invited them in and lodged with them. Uh -oh. I think that means then Peter invited the three men in and the three men lodged at Simon the Tanner's house for the night so that they could travel back to Caesarea the next day. The uh, pronouns seem to be a little strange there. On the next day, Peter went away with them, and some brethren from Joppa accompanied him. And the following day, they entered Caesarea. So it takes about a day to, to make the trip. Now Cornelius was waiting for them, uh, and had called together his relatives and close friends. 
So Peter's expecting a, a fantastic uh, event here. He's been waiting for two days uh, to get his people back with Peter to hear the message that uh, he wanted to hear that the angel told him about. As Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter lifted him up, saying, Stand up, I myself am also a man. And I have, just yesterday I talked to someone who was a Catholic, and they um, talked about their statues and the reverence they have for uh, the saints, uh, Peter and Paul and all that. And I said it seems to me like they're worshiping idols uh, and worshiping men when there's only one worthy of worship, and that's Jesus and God. Um, but the Catholics certainly uh, use a lot of imagery uh, in worship of humans, which I believe is idolatry, like the, the blatant uh, example of idolatry, the same that as the uh, Israelites making the golden calf in the wilderness coming out of Egypt. I guess the only difference is the golden calf, I don't even know where that came from, uh, but I know where the images of Peter, Paul, and Mary came from. Um, oh, he says, stand up, I myself am also a man. So Peter did not allow people to worship him, uh, and he shouldn't have. And as he talked with them, he went in and found many come together. Then he said to them, You know how unlawful it is for a Jewish man to keep company with or go to one of another nation. There it is right there. I looked these verses up. Uh, they're just New Testament verses about how the Jews uh, didn't really like hanging out with other people. Uh, I would like to have seen an Old Testament reference because I think that the Jews had really made some laws that God hadn't made uh, regarding being around other people. Because if it was a sin for Jews to hang out with other people, then... Uh, well, I'm, I'm thinking of Jesus. Uh, how many interactions did Jesus have with people that weren't Jews? Well, it was a Samaritan woman at the well, but she was probably a Jew too, but a mixed breed. But anyway... Uh, But God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. So Peter understood the vision that he had seen now. He was contemplating the vision before, wondering why he would be told to eat these different animals that he would call common or unclean. But when he was immediately met with these three men at the gate and traveled a day to Caesarea and saw Cornelius and all the people who he considered to be unclean, immediately he, he understood that God was telling him that these people that are Gentiles should not be considered common or unclean. Uh, God is giving Peter a clear message that the kingdom of God is going to include more than just the Jews. Therefore I came without objection. As soon as I was sent for, I asked, Then for what reason have you sent for me? So Cornelius said, Four days ago I was fasting until this hour, and at the ninth hour I prayed in my house, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing and said, Cornelius. So I guess one day he saw the vision. On day two, his people went out. On day three, they came back. So maybe this is the fourth day when they actually talk uh, to each other. So, and, and said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard and your alms are remembered in the sight of God. Send therefore to Joppa and call Simon here, whose surname is Peter. He is lodging in the house of Simon a Tanner by the sea. When he comes, he will speak to you. So I sent to you immediately, and you have done well to come. Now therefore, we are all present before God to hear all the things commanded you by God. So he's got an open-minded audience, uh, a godly audience. The only problem is they're not Jews. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth, I perceive. So how? I just imagine how much all these people in the house, this Roman centurion who gathered all these people in the house and said, There's a great man of God come to give us a message. I don't know what he's going to say, but he's going to give us a message from God. So they were just, 
an open-minded audience uh, willing to accept whatever Peter said because it was a message from God. In truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality. So if that's the way he started, you know, this God not being a respecter of persons or not showing partiality, um, I think requires some explanation. Because if God saves, as the Bible says he does, by grace, not according to works, then there's nothing any person can do to convince God to save them. God chooses to save whoever he wants to save based on his own will uh, and his own prerogative, I guess. Uh, and why would he save one over another? Why would he give grace to one and not to another? Because you only are saved by grace. Uh, and I don't just mean the salvation itself is the grace. I mean anything you have or know that is true and good and right and just is a gift of grace. Any knowledge you have, any wisdom you have, any good attitude you have uh, is a gift of grace. And so God gives us grace, a fallen race of people who are bent on selfishness and sin. He puts grace in your hearts, changes your mind, gives you an open uh, and open mind and a soft heart. Uh, and he gives you, blesses you with knowledge and wisdom to know the truth of things. So you could say, well, God must be a, someone who shows partiality then if he gives one person grace but not another. I don't think that's what this is talking about. He's just saying as a, as a nation, he does not uh, prefer only the Jews over everybody else. In fact, he makes this point here. Uh, right after he says, no, God shows no partiality. But in, So I would really put a comma there. Instead of a period, it's not like that's a standalone sentence. It's tied to this sentence. But in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. So he's not he's saying, in truth, I perceive that God does not only love the Jews when he says shows no partiality. Uh, but God loves people of all nations, whoever fears him and works righteousness. Now, the, the ticker to that is, I believe, whoever fears God and works righteousness can only fear God and work righteousness if God has given them grace to fear Him and to work righteousness. Because I don't think we can fear God and work righteousness unless God gives us that grace to do it. Uh, but anyway, that's enough on that. The word which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. Now this <laughs> preaching peace, Isaiah 57, Ephesians 2, 14. Uh, yeah. You know, in some in some occasions, I mean, he said I didn't come to, well, I'm talking about bringing peace or bringing a sword. Uh, he brought peace from one perspective, spiritual peace, satisfaction that we can be saved and forgiven of our sins that we have a legitimate and genuine effective sacrifice to atone for our sins. Uh, but he also talked about how he was going to cause division where father would hate uh, children and mother and brother and sister and cousin and mother-in-law were going to hate each other and all this stuff. So uh, it caused physical division but spiritual peace. Preaching peace through Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. That word you know, which was proclaimed throughout all Judea. So I've talked about the Cornelius' religion, and maybe he was not really a Jew, but he was held in high regard by the Jews. Uh, maybe because he was a uh, someone who had heard and understand the message of Jesus and was trying to implement some of those godly attributes that Jesus taught about. Uh, so he was like a quasi-Christian, maybe. Just a godly person who didn't really have the understanding, he complete understanding he needed. Because he talks about knowing the message that Jesus preached uh, all throughout Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good 
and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all these things which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they killed by hanging on a tree. Him God raised up on the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but to witnesses chosen before by God. So who saw Jesus after he was resurrected? Not everybody, but only those predetermined people that God chose to show him to. Uh, so even to us who ate and drank with him after he arose from the dead, and he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that it is he who was ordained by God to be judge of the living and the dead. To him all the prophets witness that through his name, whoever believes in him will receive remission of sins. So I think that's the key point to, you know, uh, uh, people want people want to know for absolute certain that they are the ones who are saved, that they are the ones who have the forgiveness of sins, and say, how do you know if God has actually predetermined people's salvation? How do you know whether you are predetermined to be saved or not? Well, the only evidence that I can point to from the scriptures is if you're a believer then God has given you grace to know that and believe that and you have remission of sins. Um, that through his name, whoever believes in him will receive remission of sins. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word. So we've seen evidence before that the uh, imparting the Holy Spirit First of all, in Acts chapter 2, to those apostles, there was no laying on of hands of anybody. It just fell from the sky like tongues of fire landing on each one of them. So God did it. He, that's why he baptized them in the Holy Spirit. Didn't physically touch them. No one else physically touched them. They just got the Holy Spirit, the gift of the Holy Spirit. Then there was uh, evidence of uh, people being baptized but not receiving the Holy Spirit until the apostles, Peter and John, came and touched them, laid hands on them, and then they received the Holy Spirit. Now we have an, uh, another occasion where God uh, baptizes with the Holy Spirit, and it's not translated by the laying on the hands of the apostles, because one of the apostles is right here, but he doesn't, it doesn't say he touched them. It just says uh, that the Holy Spirit fell on those who heard the word. And those of the circumcision, probably those people from Joppa who were traveling with Peter, who believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out by God on the Gentiles also. Uh, so Peter had the dream about, you know, not calling anything common or unclean. But man, this would have been uh, definitive, physical, visible evidence that... God was accepting the Gentiles into his kingdom. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnified God. Then Peter answered, Can anyone forbid water that these should not be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized or immersed in water in the name of the Lord. Then they asked him to stay a few days. So I know people like to have a discussion about, you know, when you're saved. Uh, Peter said, anyone who believes will receive remission of sins. Uh, and then the Holy Spirit fell on those who believed as evidence that God accepted the Gentiles. And then they talked about being immersed in water. Uh, so a lot of people that I grew up with lean so heavily on Acts 2.38 that says, repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. Uh, so they want to say that you cannot receive remission of sins until after you're immersed in water. And if you do it for any reason other than for the purpose of receiving remission of sins, then you've done it for the wrong reason. If you do it to be added to the church or if you do it as evidence of your faith or an appeal to God for good conscience, like the scriptures say, then they would discount the baptism and say it was not effective. But this occasion right here uh, is not the same sequence of events that you have in Acts 2.38. 
Oh. Now the Bible says over and over in the New Covenant, whoever believes in him will be saved, will receive remission of sins, as we read in this chapter. Oh. Now, I don't discount baptism, but I don't think baptism is uh, the focal point of salvation. The focal point of salvation is belief. When you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that he died on the cross for the remission of your sins, that he at made atonement for your sins, when you believe, in, that's the focal point. Of salvation. Now that's not that's not the end all be all because, you know, I guess we could point out occasions where people believe at one point and then change their mind or start living a different life later. So it's not like once saved, always saved. But the focal point of salvation is belief, is faith, uh, and baptism is a natural, uh, regular. Uh, approved uh, response to believing. When you believe, you say, "What? What? What should I do?" Uh, that's just a natural response, not not what should I do in order to earn salvation, but how do I need to live my life now that I'm a Christian? Now that I believe in Jesus, how should I live my life? Well, you need to uh, engage in baptism, which is representative of the death, burial, and resurrection of your Lord to be immersed in water, to be resurrected out of the water, and rise to walk in newness of life. So have a different perspective. Now you should focus on spiritual things instead of earthly things. Instead of your physical satisfaction uh, or comfort or your job or your retirement, now you start thinking about your eternal salvation, uh, how you can influence and others for good, uh, and how you can store up treasure in heaven and not on earth. Uh, so I think that's, uh, I don't know, that's the way I would describe it at this time. That's not the way I would always have described it. Because I used to lean, I believe, too heavily on baptism being the focal point and the purpose for baptism and uh, everything else, kind of like, the well, that's the people, that's the way I was raised. Uh, I don't discount baptism now. It is a, uh, I don't I hate to use the word necessary, but as if it's a requirement. Uh, it's just a natural response. It's what you do. It's what they did, and it's what you should do. Uh, when you become a faithful follower of Christ, you should want to do uh, the things that he asks you to do. And baptism is one of them. Uh, loving your neighbor is another one. And, uh, you know, doing good works is another one. Studying to show yourself approved is another one. So there's a lot of things that we're supposed to do after we come to the realization of what it takes to be a Christian, which is to believe on him uh, that is the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so that completes Acts chapter 10.